Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of Fulani, The Enemy Within, A Reply, Part 2. And of course, this very important notice to you, our dear viewer, that it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is also no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone with this video. The goal of this video is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, you don't set a fox to watching chickens just because he has a lot of experience in the hen house. Harry Truman and from Marcos Gavi, we must give up the silly idea of folding our hands and waiting on God to do everything for us. If God had intended for that, then he would not have given us a mind. Whatever you want in life, you must make up your mind to do it for yourself. And also from Malcolm X, you can't hate the roots of a tree and not hate the tree. And here is a very big shout out to our donors. Remember you too could support us at paypal.me forward slash rrenaissance or patreon.com forward slash rrenaissance. Thank you. And before we go into our topic of today proper, let us quickly show you some of the things you must consider before you believe anything you are told. Remember what Malcolm told us, that if you continued listening to others, Without checking things out yourself, you will ultimately end up hating your friends and loving your enemies, which is ideally what the slave master did both with his religion and with his lies. And you may have seen a lot of people who dismiss the books or the recorded history we reference here or elsewhere saying the books are too old and should not be believed or some of them claim or allege that the books were written by the slave masters. Some even come to ask you for books written by Negroes at that time. Now remember, some of those people are ignorant. Some of them are doing it deliberately to distract everyone. One thing you have to bear in mind is that not everyone at that time supported the slave trade. For example, when you hear white people or Europeans or even Arabs or even the Fulanese, it is not all of them. They are bound to be humans within them. So the same way you look at the books, you have to remember there were those against it and they had to report accurately. You had seen some records where people lied consistently about the Negroes and some people will say no this is not true. So we want you to look at these books from those angles and remember that when they tell you that the books are too old, they are telling you something else they want you to believe. Always remind yourself that those people telling you were not born by then. So they were just trying to tell you what they want you to believe, not the truth. They know that when you believe their lie, it is to their advantage. So let us quickly reference observations on the slave trade and the description of some part of the coast of Guinea during a voyage made in 1787 and 1788 in company with Dr. A. Sperman and Captain Arrhenius by C. B. Wattstrom and this was published 1789 and there he tells us something of interest. In exposing to the world the atrocious acts committed in that part of the globe to which I have been eyewitness, it is not improbable that both the nations and individuals who have countenanced them may consider the writer in the light of a spy and a divulger of those things which ought in honor to have been buried in silence. But if they can find no other appellation for the just and pure intentions of a friend to mankind who dares to expose crimes and cruelties which the abusers of human rights are guilty of, he then accounts it an honor in discharging the duty he owes to society to be esteemed as such. But let it be well observed that herein he speaks from a respect due only to truth with a view to expose wickedness and falsehood but not nations or individuals. So our interest in referencing this material is for you to see some of the salient reasons some people could not even speak out at that time and for you to also remember there were those who 
couldn't bear it. It was brutal. You can see it happening today. So part of the reason we want you to look at these materials diligently on your own, you don't need to believe us. We don't even want you to believe us because if you believe us, it is from frying pan to fire. You have jumped from one slavery bandwagon to another. The other was that the slave master told you. This one is that another group told you. We want you to reason things out yourself. Study the materials and try to picture what could have transpired by then. That's our interest. So when you look at these things yourself, the records, you will see how ludicrous some of the claims by people like Dan Calloway can be. For example, you see that that book was published as at 1789. But then, he was telling us in one of his videos that by the late 1700s, which would be 1780s, 1750s, African slave women began to intermarry with actual imported African men. You know that this is as ludicrous as it doesn't make sense. So when you are taken in by these lies propagated by then, uh, believing that he looks like you, as in he's waking up black people, to a lie, something that is obviously a lie. Remember, you can't defeat a lie with another lie. It won't work. Then, you now say because this other person is a European, therefore he must be part of them. That's where you miss the point. It's important you remember that it was never all Europeans. It's never all Arabs. There were a lot of people that stood up against it at that time. The lies that are being propagated today, for example, some of them also know that it's a lie. That's why they also stand up against them. So you need to bear that important point in mind. So based on that, let us quickly reference this material. And it is the national and private advantages of the African trade considered being an inquiry how far it concerns the trading interest of Great Britain effectually to support and maintain the forts and settlements in Africa belonging to the Royal African Company of England showing what support and encouragement the Dutch and the French give to their respective African companies and so on with a new and correct map of the coast of Africa and all the European settlements humbly inscribed to the Right Honorable Henry Pelham Esquire, First Lord Commissioner of His Majesty's Treasury and Chancellor of the Exchequer and this was published in 17. 46 and there we are shown that plantation produce so that the extensive employment of our shipping in to and from america the great brood of seamen consequent thereupon and the daily bread of the most considerable part of our british manufacturers are owing primarily to the labor of negroes who as they were the first happy instruments of raising our plantations so their labor only can support and preserve them and render them still more and more profitable to their mother kingdom the negro trade therefore and the natural consequences resulting from it may be justly esteemed on inexhaustible fund of wealth and naval power to this nation and by the overplus of negroes above what have served our own plantations we have drawn likewise no inconsiderable quantities of treasure from the Spaniards who are settled on the continent of America not only for Negroes furnished them from Jamaica but by the late Asiento contract with the crown of Spain which may probably again be revived upon a peace being concluded with that kingdom. Our interest is to show you what they were doing and why we tell you to a 99% accuracy that they and the aborigine wannabes are working for the slave master so you don't just look at the document and say oh because it wasn't written by a negro you won't believe it that's our interest so you go and reflect on what you read yourself and apply your own common sense to the narrative and going further it says what renders the negro trade still more estimable and important is that near nine tenths that is nine over ten of those negroes are paid for in africa with British produce and manufactures only and the remainder with East India commodities we send no specie or bullion to pay for the products of Africa but it's certain we bring from thence very large quantities of gold and not only that but wax and ivory 
and one serves for a foreign export without the least detriment to our own product. The other is manufactured at home and afterwards carried to foreign markets to no little advantage both to the nation and the traders, from which facts the trade to Africa may very truly be said to be, as it were, all profit to the nation. The direct trade theater affords a considerable national balance in our favor and is apparently attended with such a series of advantageous consequences that no other branch whatever of our foreign traffic admits of. So our interest is for you to see what they were benefiting and then we want you to analytically look at the idea of aborigine or no aborigine compared with what these people capitalized on at that time. Remember, whether the Negroes are called aborigine or anything, it doesn't change anything. They remain in the same several positions they have always occupied since whenever. But our interest is for you to see the danger of just believing somebody simply because he claims to be working for you. The slave master understands this very well. And we want you to compare it with this lie from then that they were then shipped from Spain, that is in Europe, to Africa as commodity for African resources in the 1630s. Does this make sense to you? So could he go one step further by telling you which commodities? Now if they were shipped as commodity for African resources, that means they can't be shipped back again because you will exchange what you brought for what you want. But he is telling us that these same people were shipped to Africa f as commodity for African resources and then shipped back. So how could they have been doing that? You notice that he never mentions who is doing the shipping. Anything you see and the subject matter is the victim, know that the slave master is behind it. And then to our topic of today, do you recall from part one of this series how we presented records of razias and slave hunts by the non-Negroes? and the armies in what was Negro land and Guinea, metamorphosed from slave hunting terror groups into the army you see today. So when you see them wearing uniforms, you just need to take back the hands of time and you will arrive at the slave hunting militia of the slave hunters of old. That's just who they are. And that's why you notice that they don't fight other armed groups. They fight women and children. They fight for the interest of the slave master. They are also equipped, sponsored, and trained by the slave masters. So you understand where the whole thing is coming from. And also how the Negroes were falsely accused of being behind sale of themselves through the slave hunters. So now how could somebody have sold himself? That's our question to you. And then the Negroes lack of racial affinity and how the non-Negroes leverage on that. Now remember, when you say Africans, you don't separate yourself from the bad ones. So you see that those that massacre innocent people, be it in the middle belt of Nigeria, be it in Biafra or in Ambazonia, you will be seen as one with them. Whereas you don't do that, you are not part of it. So when they say, oh, Africans kill themselves, you will become part of it, even when you were not part of it. That's the same thing. If you see how they are saying oh, African slave trade, Africans sold themselves you will think they are talking about the same group. Whereas they are talking about a particular group, the Arabs, the Europeans, did the slave hunting themselves. But because they gang up to say it was done by the Africans, their foot soldiers lack both humanity and common sense. They are able to propagate the lie. So you remember we referenced the story of Africa and its explorers by Robert Brown, MA, PhD, Volume 1, Special Edition, and this was published 1907. And there we are told why they were capturing the slaves and how the slave master got them to be doing what they were doing. And remember that the reason was that the Fulas were a warlike people capable of placing 16,000 men in the field and prone to hostilities against their neighbors since they could not obtain European goods without slaves nor slaves without making war. So you see how it played out because they were promised those European goods they were to capture the slaves. You need to notice how the flow works. You remember today the guns they use are also made by the same people. And remember also that they excused themselves and their reason was that the people whom they thus raided, robbed and murdered never prayed to God. And that as the European factories would sell guns, powder and cloth for no other articles except black men, 
and women, the people whom the travelers tried to persuade into more peaceful pursuits had no alternative. So remember, there were some so concerned individuals, mainly from Europe, that came down and tried to persuade them to stop what they were doing. They tried it other means, it didn't work. So don't think that when they tell you, oh, they are against us, or you see somebody making a video and telling you that, oh, they are against us, and waking up black people, then it's working 99.99% for the slave master. And if you doubt what we're saying, ask us for proof. One, he is lying, and he knows he's lying. Do you think he doesn't have these Asiento contracts? He has them. But he wants to tell you what the slave master has asked him to tell you, knowing that the Negro believes what he is told. And that's why we emphasize on you going to read the books yourself. And here again, you can see that the Sultan of the Fulani, now called Sultan of Tokoto, as at 2020, says that Boko Haram, that's the Islamic terrorism you see in that part of the globe, is God's way of punishing Nigerians. So everybody now knows that all you need to deceive the Negro is to append God. Just find some place to say God said. That's all you need. They know that the Negro does not have adequate reversibility of the thought process. Where did he see God? Who is he? He is behind all these massacres you're seeing. That's why in those places, those people that knew when he was a brutal slave hunter, that's when they named the stool Satan of Sokoto. You see the same thing being played out. So now, imagine if you were believing everyone else simply because they look like you. The slave master understands this and we want you to understand it too. And please compare this statement from the Sultan that the Boko Haram and this Islamic terrorism are God's way of punishing Nigerians. Our challenge to you is to tell us how the same creator of heaven and earth could have allowed or used people with guns made by the slave masters to be killing people he suffered to create. So we want you to compare that statement made in 2020 with this one made in 18 somethings and it says, but they excused themselves for this barbarity by declaring that the people whom they thus raided, robbed and murdered never prayed to God and that as the European factories would sell guns, powder and cloth for no other articles except black men and women, the people whom the travelers tried to persuade into more peaceful pursuits had no alternative. Moreover, did not the book, in brackets, the Quran, enjoin on the faithful to make war against the infidel? We want you to compare both statements and remember we told you that everyone now knows that to subjugate and enslave the Negroes, all you need is append God to whatever lie you have for them. Let us also reference the slave trade in Africa in 1872, principally carried on for the supply of Turkey, Egypt, Persia and Zanzibar by Etienne Felix Bilox. And this was published in 1872. And here we see but in the midst of nature, which God has made so rich, sorrowful reflections come over the mind. This privileged land is the theater of slavery and the home of the manhunter, the large city of Kuka in the vicinity of Lake Chad. The capital of Bono is one of the greatest mats for this human merchandise. Now remember, if the slave master was not culpable, if his foot soldiers were not culpable, there is just no way they won't be telling you about who was. So they lied about it because they are culpable. And their lie flew because the Negroes believe what they are told. Not what they can see. Not the facts. Not the truth. But what they are told. Now please don't misconstrue what we're saying. Not because the Negro is stupid, but because he trusts the next human being. Like we told you, the Negro is love, the Negro is humanity, the Negro is an example of humanity to others. And going further down, you see where it says, but whence come all these wretched beings, and that's the slaves. It is here that the Eastern traffic is presented to us under a particular aspect, such as it did not assume on the Western coasts of Africa, in the organized commerce of slaves 
man hunting which supplies the victims for these markets is not only encouraged by the brutal ferocity of the chief of a tribe it is considered an act commanded by religion so when you hear some so-called african americans and some individuals who are awoken and they tell you that the biggest problem of the negro society is religion don't doubt them go back and research what they are saying but remember sometimes they mistake negroes with blacks so it's important you know that there's a big difference which you can find out by doing basic reading but then, here is our interest, and we want you to compare this statement here with that of the Sultan, saying that the insurrection and the terrorism in Nigeria today is a punishment from God. Remember, all they learned to do is to append God to their lies. Now, can you imagine the creator of heaven and earth that had the power to part the Red Sea, assuming we believe that the book could have been written by the Almighty? They had the power to kill people, had the power to do our things. Then it will require guns from the slave master and his foot soldiers to be killing his children as punishment. Does that really make sense to you? So compare that statement with the Sultan because it's the same Sultan, that same lineage, the Sultan of the Fulani that is being talked about here. And it says, the Sultan who goes to make razias at the head of warriors with whom he divides the booty by an impious aberration believes that he performs a pious work in spreading devastation around him so you see how instead of a so-called leader of the muslims in that sub-region to call for peace to look for a way for people to stop killing themselves he is telling you that it is punishment from god now remember some people will believe him some negroes who are muslims will believe him as well Whereas they don't even know that both Islam and Christianity are not in any way, shape or form the way of life of the Negroes prior to the slave trade. But then going forward it says this is the effect of the old Mohammedan influence and the sword of the knights follows the infidel enemies of the Quran. Now remember it was the same Quran that said the people that were hunting and killing and selling as slaves did not worship God. So you see how they use the same thing, the same tool, the same weapon over and over again and still the Negroes refuse to use their brains. And going further than it says, the accusation is a solemn one. The Sultan M. Ruff informs us is a wholesale merchant himself. What is that in which he deals? What is it? Why his brother man? He procures such for his own benefit by razias over the surrounding peoples or over his own subjects so long as these later have not embraced Islamism. So you see when they tell you Islam forbids the slave trade, you should know that they are lying. And the reason a lot of people believe it today, like we told you, the Negro listens to what he is told, is because it's a lie that has been told often enough. It's not because people do not know, it's not because they cannot read, but because it has been told often enough, the people tend to believe it even when it's a lie. And to better understand that it was impossible that the Negroes could have done it themselves. So you see where it tells you that the Negroes, however, who suffer all these horrors do not lose altogether their spirit and courage, but they have no arms and do not combine, whilst their adversaries know how to unite when the danger is serious. Sometimes the blacks, though under compulsion, lend their aid to the brigands against their neighboring peoples so at least you see how these objective author reported it now if you think it was possible for the negroes to have done it themselves how will it be saying that they cannot combine now think about it today if you ask for freedom the slave master will hide behind his brainless foot soldiers and mobilize the army the army was the slave hunting militia when we are talking about razia razia is the islamic word for slave raid so it's the same thing if it didn't exist there wouldn't be any word for it so now you are telling us that those who can mobilize the army against a civilian who just asks for roads and schools to be built is the same as the civilian they are attacking if you believe them then you don't need to watch this video sorry and going forward let us reference biographical memorials of james oglethorpe founder of the colony of georgia 
in North America. Now remember, when the Aborigines wannabes tell you about USA, USA, they don't even know it did not exist as a country until at some point. So those are some of the reasons you should know that then is lying and working for the slave master. They understand how to iteratively lie to the Negroes, which we shall prove to you in a subsequent video. But this is by Tedious Messin Harris and it was published in 1841 and there we are shown that the name of this extraordinary man was Ayub ibn Suleiman Ibrahim that is Job the son of Solomon the son of Ibrahim his nation was that of the Yolofs his tribe or caste the folly or fuller so our interest is for you to see that where they were writing folly it was the same as Fula and Fulani as you know them today and this is about the same job Ben Solomon and he goes further to say and his native place Bonda a city of Galumbo in the kingdom of Futa in central Africa opposite Tombotu which is Timbuktu Ibrahim the grandfather of Job was the founder of the city of Bonda during the reign of Abu Bekar then king of Futa who gave him the proprietorship and government of it with the title of Alpha or High Priest. So our interest is for you to look at Job Ben Solomon and the circumstances under which he was sold. And here is an image of the man who rescued him, that is Ogletop. Our interest is for you to see that he is not a Negro or a fuller so that you begin to understand the relationship between the slave master and his foot soldiers. And here he is described as being a fine figure, 5 feet 10 inches in height, of a pleasing but grave countenance and having straight black hair. So our interest is for you to see that he has straight black hair, not woolly hair, like the Negroes. And he goes further to say his natural qualities were excellent. He was possessed of a solid judgment, a ready and wonderfully retentive memory an ardent love for truth and a sweet disposition, mild, affectionate and grateful. His religion was Mahometanism and that's our interest here. But he rejected the idea of a sensual paradise and several other traditions that are held among the Thugs. Now remember that this Mahometanism was more with the Thugs than with the English but that's a subject of a different video anyways. But then at the footnote you notice that where it says black hair on top, there was a footnote and it says there is a scarce octavo portrait of him, head and shoulders only, etched by the celebrated painter Mr. Hua of Bath in 1734, as appears by a manuscript note on the impression of it in Mr. Bindley's possession. Under the print is engraved Job, son of Solomon de Gila, high priest of Banda in the country of Futa, Africa. So our interest is for you to see how these things correlate and for you to understand how the slave masters foot soldiers are used to enslave and subjugate the Negroes. Now remember when you accept we are all Africans that they deceive you with and they killed you then it casts their image on you. So everybody will say Africans are killers whereas you are not a killer. So that's why it's important you start separating yourself from the slave masters foot soldiers because they lack both humanity and common sense. They are the reason Africa is the way it is. The slave master knows this. You should be able to ask yourself, in things like Biafra and Ambazonia, if the BBC does not report it, VOA does not report it, CNN does not report it, Al Jazeera does not report it, that should tell you there must be somewhere they met and agreed not to. You should now begin to ask yourself, what could be going on? Let us then reference the strange story of Job Ben Solomon by A. Middleton and it was published in 1948 and there we are shown the portrait the other material talked about and here we see his picture and remember from his looks he looks more like an Arab than a pure Negro and that's because he had Negro blood so you see that they sold him obviously in error and the moment they discovered that he wasn't Negro they redeemed him and brought him back to his native country. Do you know any Negro that they did something like that to? The answer will be no. And this journal confirms it for us where it says racially Job was an Arab with an infusion of Negro blood. 
Culturally, he was an inheritor of the best traditions of Islam. His Arabian grandfather Ibrahim had established himself as high priest of Bunda, a small community in the Negro kingdom of Futa that lay astride the Senegal River and extended south to the Gambia River on the far side of the Mauritanian Sahara. When he died, his son, Solomon Ben Ibrahim, succeeded to his authority and continued the benevolent rule for which Bunda was celebrated. Now notice that the kingdom was Negro, but then these Arabs claiming to be either Fulanese or Moors, whichever one they chose, came to be ruling it. So when they say somebody is a slave there, you will think it's the same people enslaving themselves, just the same way it is in Nigeria today. So when they go massacre communities, you're going to be thinking it's the same people. That's the same game they are playing. Our interest is for you to open your eyes and look closely. Look for these materials and study them yourself. The slave master is never smart. He simply knows where the fools live. That's all. Let us also reference the Journal of Negro History, Carter G. Woodson, editor, volume 2, published 1917. And there, we are shown that the Felathas, who since the beginning of the 19th century have been the dominators of the Negritians in West Africa, used to carry on a merciless campaign against their subjects, destroying their homes and fields, and seizing women and children by the thousands to batter away to the west or to send across the desert. Describing the effects of a Felata raid, that's a Fulani raid, Bath says, the whole village, which only a few moments before had been the abode of comfort and happiness, was destroyed by fire and made desolate. Slaughtered men with their limbs severed from their bodies were lying about in all directions and made passers-by shudder with horror. So you see, the only reason you don't know this is because you refuse to read. So they keep telling you those people are your brothers, but they keep killing you and still make you look like a killer yourself. So you see that when they say Africans killing other Africans, it tries to paint everyone with the same brush. Whereas it is one group that is doing it for them. The same way they learned to lie that the killings in middle belt of Nigeria was herders and farmers clash. That's the same way they've been. They tell lies. But because the Negroes refuse to read, they refuse to listen to their own people. Remember the slave master controls the media. So that's why if you look at it, BBC, Al Jazeera, VOA, CNN, all of them report it as farmers and herders clash because they know that when a lie is told often enough, it begins to look like the truth. But we challenge you to go to anybody from those middle belt areas and ask them, they will tell you what is going on. But because you refuse to read these materials in order to be able to connect the dots, that's why you are misinformed. And here you see that the purchase of Felathas, that's the Fulanese, or pregnant Negro women or Jews was strictly forbidden by the Sultan. The Felathas were not bought because they boasted of being white people. The Negro women could not be bought because the child to be born would be the property of the Sultan if its mother were a heathen and it would be free if the mother were Mohammedan. And going further down, it says the raiding troops after having been on the campaign for nearly a month, returned with 2,000 captives who marched in front of the column, the men, women, old and young, almost all nude or half clad, in ragged blue cloth, and the children piled upon the camels. The women were groaning and the children crying, while the men, though seemingly more resigned, bore bloody marks upon their backs made by the whips. Now you are telling us this is a cell. Remember at that time the Negroes were not considered human, which is still the same thing they are doing today, but without telling you. So when you join the bandwagon of we are all Africans, don't be deceived. You notice that they forbade the sale of their fellow Fulanese, but you could be sold, anyone else but them. That should tell you they knew what they are doing. Today, for example, you will need to look at what is happening in Biafra and in Ambazonia, in Nigeria and in Cameroon they can come out and threaten everybody they can come out and kill you the law does not apply to them but if you said or even condemned their action you become a target so you need to bear that in mind so when you are looking at things like national assembly all those things are mere lame duck 
they are as useless as you can imagine. The army remains the same slave hunters they were. So that's why the moment you talk about freedom, it is the army that comes after you. And remember the good thing about this material, the Journal of Negro History, it was that the editor was Carter G. Woodson, supposedly a Negro. So if you are listening to somebody like Dan Calloway today, one question you need to ask yourself is, how come Carter G. Woodson didn't know about what he's talking about? But he now knows. He wasn't born by then. He doesn't give you something that is even sensible enough. You can imagine where somebody tells you that a product was shipped to Africa and exchanged or as commodity for African resources and then shipped back to America. Whereas if you exchange something, it stays with whoever you exchanged it with. But above all, to know that they are lying is the fact that they are not telling you who was the one shipping the Negroes. They are telling you about the Negroes only and how they are Aborigine or Niji or every other rubbish they concoct. But they don't tell you who was behind their hunt, raid and capture. Therein lies the challenge. Therein lies the big question. Why do you think they are not telling you about those? They keep telling you they were captured from America, shipped to Europe, from Europe to Africa and then from Africa back to America. Your question is, why do they not tell you who shipped them? back and from where who captured them they don't tell you that that should tell you right there that they are lying and here you see how they check to make sure that non-negroes are not there the fulanese are not there so you see where it says but suddenly there was a mighty noise of crying and groaning of calling at each other and bidding farewell to friends some were so overcome at the fear of being eaten that they rolled upon the ground and absolutely refused to walk Nothing could persuade them to get up until a guard came along with his great whip which brought blood at each lash. Now that guard they are talking about is the army, the Nigerian army you see today or the Cameroonian army. Those are the slave hunting militia. That you find Negroes in them is due to conditioning which is subject of a different video. But going forward you see what our interest is. As the great army passed through the gate of the city, an officer of the Sultan examined every slave to be sure none was a felata, Mohammedan or Jew, that felata is Fulani. The guard caravan happened to have among its slaves a felata who was at once discovered and set free. At the first camp, said Domas, each caravan established its bivouac separately and as soon as the camels were crushed and after having chained our negro women by the feet and in groups of eight or ten, we forced our negro men to aid us with the left hand which we had left free to unload our baggage to arrange it in a circle. Those are not our interests. Our interest is for you to see how it was and why we strongly believe that the slave master is behind the aborigine or energy or indian narrative whatever be the case you need to also remind yourself of the fact that when they say they are all africans it is this same group that make everybody look foolish so remember if you notice they do not capture and sell their own people they do not hunt and raid them with the army they don't invade their houses and burn their homes with the army in a place like nigeria today but they turn around and tell you we are all Nigerians. They turn around and tell you one Nigeria. Now they make the whole of us look foolish. Remember, it's only a fool that will be doing all this. Think of it any way you like. It's only a fool that will be doing all this. The slave master knows this, but you don't know it. That's why you keep claiming that somebody who murdered your siblings is also your brother. Now if you told the person has apologized, it becomes different. So they use them to make all of us look foolish. That's the truth. So the moment you keep saying, oh, African sold us, you are tarring everybody with the same brush, making everybody look foolish. Whereas it's only a few, the slave master's foot soldiers. And here you see that the next day, the caravans were obliged to stop in consequence of a Negro woman who gave birth to a child. This stop, however, was not very lengthy. In a few hours, she and her infant were placed upon a camel and the caravan went forward. When the camp was pitched for a next night, the leader, in making his rounds, ordered that the young Negro mother be left unshackled and that she be given some meat for supper and allowed to sleep warmly upon a mat. 
But during the night, when everything was quiet, the mother put her infant in a basket filled with ostrich feathers, placed it upon her head, and made her escape. Our interest is to ask you, you claim the Negroes were selling themselves, so you are telling us that the husband or the chief just came and took the woman and sold her. So why is she escaping if she was just sold? Or when the chief was selling her, she doesn't know how to escape or didn't know how to escape. She had no husband to speak up for her. Again, you notice that the stop was not lengthy because at that time, the Negroes hadn't been made part of this forbidden fruit conspiracy where childbirth became prolonged, complicated, difficult and all that as concocted by the slave masters. But our interest is for you to read between the lines and see what could have transpired. So when they come to tell you how you are all Nigerians, you will be bold enough at least outside that hellhole. Ask questions like, if they were brothers, why are you killing your brothers then? You will understand. The slave master knows what we are just telling you. The only difference between you and the slave master is that he knows where the fool lives. But you keep claiming that the fool is your brother. That's the problem. There is no way somebody who murders your parents, your siblings, feels good about it, can be your sibling. It doesn't make sense. It would have only made sense if he was murdering everybody. You would say, oh, that's how we are. But this is, he murders you but doesn't touch his own people. And you still can't see that they are different. But they make all of us look foolish. And the slave master knows why he reports it as, oh, Africans, Nigerians. If you doubt what we're saying, follow the Biafra and Ambazonia agitations closely. You will see that the slave master will always tell you that the Biafra agitation is Igbos. Ask yourself, why is he doing it? No matter what you do, that's because that's how they've always done it. If you want to understand it, ask yourself, when the first slaves landed in the USA, as they claim, what happened the day after? What happened the month after? What happened the year after? And how did it get to 400 years? That's the same way. People talked, people condemned, but the slave master turned the other way and continued what he was doing. The same way, if you like, condemn the killings. If you like, celebrate the killings. The slave master will continue doing his thing, but you will still be made to look stupid to the rest of the world. And based on this, we got a comment of interest from our last video. And the question was something like, I wonder what your take is on the content of this video. Now remember the home team, we had made videos about them previously because we noticed that they were also protecting the Fulanese, claiming the same way they claimed as their alibi that they were also sold. Now remember, in the transaction, there has to be a buyer and a seller. There has to be an agreement with what to buy and what to sell. We had shown you where they said the Europeans would not sell them goods except in exchange for this. Whereas the Negroes can manufacture things, these people cannot. So that's why the slave master figured that if he can use what he manufactures to decoy them and deceive them to start capturing the Negroes, since they already hated the Negroes, that worked for him. And in response to this question or this comment, we looked at the video by the Home Teen History and it was titled, Are We Victims of the Slave Trade? And then he went on to talk about the slave trade and those who were involved. Now remember, we had attacked them in the past when they tried to shield and protect the Fulani because the person or the group making the video had Fulani interest. We saw places where they carefully avoided some areas, which is something akin to what you see the Aborigine wannabes do. They will try to avoid or navigate away from where Malcolm X said we are African but happen to be in America and present something totally different. So somehow, apparently, they had gone to conduct a more elaborate research and if you were to watch that video at about the 4.55 mark, you see where he says, Dahomey was a nation formed from the oppression of the Yoruba people. Now, further down at about 446, he said some of them even joined the army to protect their children from the Yoruba slave raiding cavalry of Oyo. We want you to note these two things. But our interest is to show you the challenge of trying to navigate or tell lies 
especially when the truth does not favor you remember all you need to debunk the slave master is to look for the truth avoid whatever anyone is saying look for the truth whatever it is the truth will defeat a lie but another lie can never defeat the truth first you will see the biggest fault with what he has just said here is the fact that yoruba did not exist until around 1808 dahomey were the slave hunters with the oyos but then the oyos and the dahomians we can't even place which one is different from the other which we are going to prove to you shortly but then yoruba was an appellation created by the slave master and he has fulans anagos akos negroes ibos inside it together so that's where the challenge is now he is telling you that yoruba people were oppressing dahomey because he is trying to protect dahomey he is trying to justify their slave raiding escapades so let us reference abiokuta and the cameroon's mountains an exploration by richard f button in two volumes volume one and this was published 1863 and there we are shown that in kakanda is the celebrated ife said if we believe the maps to be the origin of idolatry it is the spot where the yoruba nation and all others arose the eden of these regions moreover from it sprang the sea and they show the source of the largest river known to them namely the osa lagoon running between lagos and godome the dahomans who like other yorubans things derive their faith call it faith or whatever but our question to you is dahomians who like other yorubans so that means dahomians are yorubans so if you check in nigeria today you will see that yorubans exist outside nigeria so that you understand their game like we told you the slave master created yoruba and added a lot of groups into it for example you see where it says the Ijebus, a warlike race have ever been the most deadly enemies of the Ibars, who in return gave them the bad name of being the most barbarous of the yoruban tribes now when you read this you will think there was a group existing before then that were called yorubans but this is a name given to them by the slave master this is why you notice that the moment you coin any name for yourself the slave master will come with his trouble that's why if you see in southern nigeria the moment the so-called southwest today created amoteku the fulanis were crying all over the place like babies because they know their plan they don't like anything that will bring people together against their evil plan that's who they are you can't change it so as you keep claiming you are the same with them they keep dealing with you that's the truth of it if you doubt what we're saying conduct your research that's the best we can tell you and back to what the home team history was saying you see that he said that the dahomians created an army because of oyo slave raiding against them so from the yorubas he called it but the question becomes if the dahomians are the same as yorubas what does that tell you it tells you that they are the same people but the question becomes who are the other peoples under them you, one of the things you have to bear in mind is that the whole target is the negroes but the Negroes have no idea of racial affinity. That's how the slave master put it. So they don't know who is their brother and who is not. And because they listen to what they are told, instead of what they can see, instead of what they can know, they mistake the enemy for their friend and then hate their friend because of what their enemy tells them. That's the important thing to bear in mind. You will notice that the slave master's foot soldiers will always support the slave master in anything against their so-called siblings including using their guns and bullets and bombs against them so our interest is for you to see the difference it is that difference that will make you begin to understand whatever lies they tell you even before they tell you the lies you will know where they are going the little thing of interest is where it says a lorry which richard lander writes a lorry a province and a city of that name inhabited by muslim fullers and Gambari, a tribe of Hausa men, together with a few pagan Yorubas. Remember, there was nobody called Yoruba before 1808. The slave master created that appellation. So he annexed some Negro kingdoms and put them under one umbrella because that's what he does. If you notice, he has created Southwest from the old Eastern region 
now keeps telling you that Biafra is only the southeast and all that. That's how the slave master works. So ultimately, the next generation will grow up believing that they have no business with this side. So if you don't understand his game, you will never understand his treachery. You will never understand his tricks or his lies. So he keeps telling it. Now as they are talking about it, the old generation are dying. Those who saw the old eastern region are dying. Those whose mothers are from those other places are dying. But the next generation growing up from childhood are hearing that this place is different from that place. Meanwhile, they know they are lying. But then they think they are smart simply because their foot soldiers lack both humanity and common sense. And you see that the king is a fuller and the chiefs are mostly Gambari and Kaniki. About 1820, Lori became independent of Yoruba proper. It then proclaimed the jihad and assisted in the destruction of Oyo or Eyo. Of late years, Elori has suffered at the hands of Ibadan, but he has recovered since the later people have been weakened by their wars with Abiyokuta. About 1850, Masaba of Nupe, a half-caste fuller, made a coalition to attack Elori and his chief, Chita, a, re a relation of his own whose daughter he had married. Two years afterwards, however, Masaba was driven out by his subjects and the lad his capital on the banks of the Niger was burnt. So you see how brutal they have always been. You see that that was a half-caste fuller. Now, when they are telling you Negroes are aborigines, they show you some dark Indians and all that. You want to look at the hair. The hair gives everything away. Those are half-caste Indians. That is where an Indian slave master slept with a Negro woman and they produced the child. That's where they got those dark people. If you notice, if you were to apply common sense, you will see that they are very few. They are not as much as either the real Indians or Native Americans or the Negroes. They are fewer, no doubt, because the Europeans enslaved the Negroes more than the Indians, but they are all slaves to the other. There is no way the two can be the same. Biologically, it's impossible for them to have existed side by side. So it doesn't matter how many times the lie is told. This one is difficult for them to sell because of the woolly hair of the Negro. And still on the home team history and the Dahomey Fulani question, let us reference Abeokuta or Sunrise within the tropics, an outline of the origin and progress of the Yoruba mission by Miss Tucker, and this was published in 1855. Please remember that he mentioned a group that he claimed were warlike. Now ask yourself if they were all the same in one Yoruba, so to say, why will a group be described as warlike against the other? But we want you to note that comment first. We shall look at it much later in this same video. But then, to the Dahomey question, remember the home team told you that the Dahomeyans created an army because Yorubas were ready them for slaves, which we know is a lie because if Yoruba came into existence as at 1808 and the slave trade, at least by the British at that time, had outlawed slave raiding by 1808, that should tell us that somebody was behind it before 1808. Let's leave the rest to mere conjectures and look at this material. And you remember we referenced this material in part 1 as well before this comment was made. Now remember, some people make comments and innocently that's how much of what the materials are saying they understand. But if they can be able to look at different sources, different materials, and understand what they are each saying, then they will be able to connect the dots. So here you see where it says the Felatas, that's the Fulanese. And here it tells us that the hidden kings of Dahomey, remember he said Dahomey created an army to protect themselves from the Oyo who were raiding them, which he called Yoruba, whichever name he chose. That's not our interest here. But then it tells us about the Dahomey hidden kings here stand out conspicuously in the barbarous warfare but even they must yield in this disgraceful preeminence to the Mohammedan Felatas. So you see that clearly it was the Felatas or Fulanese that were the brutal slave hunters more than the Dahomeans. So it doesn't make sense for anybody to tell you that the Dahomeans created their army because they were being oppressed by people who did not exist at that time. He probably doesn't know his own is a bit more on the innocent side of 
ignorance, so to say, as against Dane's own. Dane's own is a deliberate propaganda by the slave masters because he understands that if he can turn the Negroes to Aborigines or whatever he chooses or Native Indians, then the slave trade will become a lie. That's all he's trying to do, nothing more than that. They understand their game, that's just what they are trying to do. If you doubt what we're saying, if Dane even makes a video today to say this is a lie, sorry and apologize, the so-called African Americans will say, oh he has sold out because they don't look at the destination, they don't look at the source, they just look at the person telling them, so as far as it looks like them, they believe the person is working for them. It doesn't matter if they lie or the message is against them. That's why you notice that anything the slave master wants to sell to the Negroes, he looks for somebody that looks like him. It didn't start today. They used Crowder to sell Christianity. They used um, Kanye West to sell Jesus today to, them, to them. They are using them to sell the Niji and Indian or Aboriginal wannabe narrative to them as well. They always look for somebody that looks close to what the Negroes would trust. That's all they know because they understand that if the Negroes trust you, you can tell them a lie from now till tomorrow. They will believe you even when the lie doesn't make sense. So you remember the one we told you that said we are a warlike race among the Yorubans according to them and that's the Jebus versus the Ibas, whichever one they were talking about just to show you that one they are not the same, two the slave master created that Yoruba as an umbrella to help him control and subjugate the group there. It includes Dahomey, Oyo and Negroes. We are not sure what the relationship between Oyo and Dahomey is because all these names were fabricated and concocted by the slave masters. None of them has any meaning in the local languages in the areas. So you need to bear that in mind. So let us reference the Encyclopedia Britannica 11th edition. This was published 1910. And there we are shown the history of Abiokuta. Abiokuta was the capital of the Ibaz. The Ibaz were like Biafra today. They also fought for independence. But the slave master, hiding behind his fuller foot soldiers, forcefully annexed them and subjugated them under the same Fulanese. So we see that Abiokuta is a town of British West Africa in the Iba division of the Yoruba country. Remember, the slave master created the Yoruba country as it were. But the Ibas were different and they were Negroes as well. And our little proof to you is it says that Bokuta lies in a beautiful and fertile country, the surface of which is broken by masses of grey granite. But then our interest is further down where it says from 1825 owes its origin to the incessant inroads of the slave hunters from Dahomey and Ibado which compelled the village population scattered over the open country to take refuge in the rocky stronghold against the common enemy. Here they constituted themselves a free confederacy of many distinct tribal groups, each preserving the traditional customs, religious rites and even the very names of their original villages. Yet this apparently incoherent aggregate held its ground successively against the powerful armies often sent against the place both by the king of Dahomey from the west and by the people of Ibadan from the northeast. So you see how they will tell you today that they are all Yorubas. It's the same Fulanese that are in control there and the Dahomeans, they are together. The slave master knows who they are. They were slave hunting partners. They have an inherent hatred for the Negroes. You need to understand that. So when a Negro is conquered, he is also conditioned to hate his siblings. So that's why you see that the so-called Southwest, sometimes you see them speaking against Southeast and South-South as they are called today. But that's the attribute of a Negro when they are conquered. That's who they become like they are conquerors and of course inherit that inherent hatred of the Negro race by their conquerors. That's just what is happening. It might be difficult for you to understand but all you need to do is read and study extensively about how the scenario was at that time. In the event you still don't understand the difference between the victims and the victors so to say. The difference between those who take weapons from the slave master to murder their siblings. Let us quickly reference the Negro, the southerner's problem 
by Thomas Nelson Page and this was published 1904 and there we are shown that man was created free. His personal liberty was implied in his assignment to dominion over all the earth and over the animals. Hence man can be enslaved but since you cannot enslave the horse or the dog, how can you enslave the ape? They all belong to one kind of flesh and we are placed under man's dominion in the creation. This absurd idea that is optional with man to enslave or to emancipate the negro is another result of placing man and the ape in the same family. We want you to ask yourself what this means and then we want you to do a comparative analysis between these type of thought and their foot soldiers in what was Negro land and Guinea. Now you look at a place like Nigeria for example, somebody believes that another who looks close to him, looks like him, is an idiot and an ape, while he takes weapons from the same person that calls him a fool to be killing others. That should tell you who the real fools are. Our interest is for you to understand this difference very well. It doesn't matter how you say it, a truth is still a truth, even if no one believes it. And a lie is still a lie, even if everyone believes it. So you can see that we are different from the Fullers. The Negroes are different. The Hamites are different. And going further, it says, Had the Negro been imported here as an ape, as God made him, and had we maintained only such relations with him as were legitimate, the combined world would have been powerless to have taken a Negro from the South. God would have stood by the South to defend and maintain the relation of master and servant which he established between man and the Negro in creation. But instead of this, under the influence of the theory of development combined to a certain extent with equally anti-scriptural church theory that the Negro is the son of Ham, he was brought here as a lower race of man. The Ham race whom it was legitimate to enslave as a means of civilizing educating and christianizing as might have been expected an amalgamation at once began and soon it transformed every farm and many a home in the southland into a harem it debauched the youth and manhood of the land it sent many a fond devoted wife and mother broken-hearted to the grave it corrupted the flesh and defiled the earth and brought our country under the cause of heaven unto God in his wrath and discourse decreed that the so-called slavery system which was conceived in crime brought forth in iniquity and was based solely on his violated law should be blotted from the face of the earth. Then angels wept and devils laughed at the spectacle presented here by a continent drenched in the blood of its sons, hemispheres in mourning, the civilized world in tears. So you see that their foot soldiers lack both humanity and common sense. Even if they read this, it can never change them. You need to bear that in mind. If you remember, there were those that went to the Fulanese to see if they could talk them out of slave hunting. They couldn't. You see what they are doing in the sub-region today. All the slave master does is give them weapons and they will strike. They enjoy it. That's what they love doing. If you doubt what we're saying, bring one of them here to come and defend what they're doing. If you doubt what we're saying, conduct additional research yourself, you will understand what we're saying. It doesn't matter if you claim they were your siblings. It doesn't matter if you say they are. What matters is what do they think about you. Ordinarily, you will see that if they read things like this, they will ask themselves basic questions like, how can people that look like us be classified as uh, apes? Then they will have a rethink. But instead of having the rethink, they feel good that those they are killing, like they told you, they were not worshipping God. You can imagine who they are. You saw the Sultan today in 2020 telling you that the insurrections and Boko Haram and the terrorism is God's way of punishing Nigerians. So you see how they are understanding and how their reasoning works. And that's why the slave master will continue to use them. So when you say you are the same with them, you need to understand where you are putting yourself. You are putting yourself at the same level as them. Let us also reference the Fullers of Central Africa and the African Slave Trade by W.B. Hudson. And this was published 1843. And there we are shown that 
On the Niger and in Sudan, they occupy or have conquered the kingdoms of Yariba. Now remember, Yariba was what the slave master created Yoruba as before it became Yoruba. It used to be Yariba. Nufi, Hausa and others. There is an immense country yet unexplored by the white man, 800 miles in extent, between Bambra on the west and Yariba on the east, and lying in the rear of the Green and Ivory Coast. This unknown land is supposed to be occupied by Fulas. Such is the geographical distension of this singular race, that's the Fulanese. Then he goes further to tell us that the Fulas are not Negroes. They differ essentially from the Negro race in all the characteristics which are marked by physical anthropology. They may be said to occupy the intermediate space betwixt the Arab and the Negro. Now remember, this same definition is what the Moors were described as. We have always asked anyone that knows where did the Moors disappear to and where did the Fulanese appear from. You need to understand this because that's how subtle the slave master can be. He could have just rebranded them, renamed them so that the Negroes will not be able to connect the dots. That's why you see them claiming to be the same with somebody who is killing them. Somebody who is making destitutes, making widows of women, making widowers of men, making orphans of children is who they are claiming as their brother. You can imagine. The same slave hunters of old anyways. So he goes further to say, all travelers concur in representing them as a distinct race, in moral as in physical traits. To their color, the various terms of bronze, copper, reddish, and sometimes white has been applied. They concur also in the report that the fullers of every region represent themselves to be white men and proudly assert their superiority to the black tribes among whom they live. So that's why if you notice in a place like Nigeria, they will never allow anybody to rule except themselves. They must be the one to rule. It's not like they rule well. It's not like they do things right. The slave master knows it is through them that he can steal all the resources. Give them guns. That's all they need. And then give them a little of their products. Then command them. And they can wipe out an entire community. In fact, ordinary arrest of a lawyer. They will go there and burn the whole house. That's who they are. The same way they were as slave hunters. That's the same thing they do till today. And here he tells us also that the Fulas are a warlike race of shepherds and within this century they have established a political organization, subjugated a large portion of Sudan and founded Sakatu, the capital of their empire, which is called Sokoto today in Nigeria. You can go and research it yourself. Clapperton says that this town, which was built in 1805 by Danfodio the prophet, and the first political and military chief of the Fulas was the most populous which he had seen in Central Africa. At the period of his visit, the Sultan was Belo, or according to Mr. D. Avezak, correct orthography, Mohammed B. Ella. He also writes Danfodio, Otsman Zon El Nafadia, or Otsman the Destroyer. And he goes further to say, the Fullers are rigid Mohammedans and according to Molian, the French travelers report, they are animated by a strong zeal for proselytism. They are the missionaries of Islam among the pagan Negro tribes. And that's our interest. Wherever they have conquered, they have forced the adoption of the Quran by the sword. And whilst pursuing quietly their pastoral occupations, they become schoolmasters, marlins, and thus propagate the doctrines and precepts of Islam. Now, somebody somehow today believes that Islam forbids the slave trade, whereas you see that the merchants of the slave hunting are the same ones that brought you Islam. So you see that both sides are not the correct thing. Whatever the Negroes had was likely the correct thing, which we shall look at in a subsequent video anyways. So for the sake of context, we read further down where it says, wherever the fuller has wandered, the pagan idolatry of the Negro has been overthrown, the barbarous fetish and Gregory have been abandoned, anthropophagy and cannibalism have been suppressed, and the horrible sacrifice of human beings to propitiate the monstrous gods of the Negro barbarian has been supplanted by the worship of the true God. Now remember, it's not like their own God or whatever they brought, their concept of God was more powerful than what the Negroes had. 
they deceived the Negroes to abandon the creator of heaven and earth and follow their own gods. You need to understand this. You just need to research it. That's all you need to do. Don't be deceived by their calling it fetish, calling it idolatry. Because if whatever the Negroes were doing was idolatry, then their altars will be idolatry too. Their Kaaba will be idolatry too. But that's a different thing on its own. So let's just move forward. And also it tells us here that if Sultan Belo should be induced to abolish the slave trade, the most efficient means will have been discovered for its entire suppression. The example of so great an empire or the menace of its chief would effectually check the inhuman cupidity or barbarism of the lesser tribes of the coast. Such an event would cause a great revolution in the commerce of those countries and the arts of civilized life would in consequence be speedily adopted. So if he had no hand in it, if the Sultan was not in control, why would they say he should be induced to abolish the slave trade? Now remember, it doesn't matter if you doubt this or not. All you need to do is if you look at what they are doing today, it doesn't take you much to figure out what could have happened in the past. And here you see where it says, to gain over the Felatas to the abolition party is certainly the most desirable thing as there the axe would be led to the root of the slave trade. So, so what more can we add to this? If you notice, it's still them. Yes, there were other groups like the Dahomians and the Ashantis, but at least we read where it told you that these are the main culprits. That's why they are still doing it till tomorrow morning. And that's why the slave master loves them. So when you see the likes of John Kerry or the US government or British government's troop to the Sultan, they are not going there because they love you. However, to see what it looks like in the real sense of it, for somebody to say, oh, we are all Africans, we are all Nigerians, especially if you're a Negro, you'll see what happened when some people, they thought the same way you might be thinking. You remember the home team, team actually did say that the slaves were captured by everyone and everyone was a slave hunter just to show you that he was all doing that because he has his uh, genealogy showing he has Fulani blood but he forgets that there are two sides to it there are many people with Fulani blood because they were sleeping with the Negro women you have no right to assume one part of it for the other yes blood is thicker than water but then the truth still has to be told so it doesn't matter how he changes it it doesn't matter how to he twists it the truth is these were the main culprits the records show that so he obviously avoided some of the because it doesn't favor the Fulani and above all he needed to protect his other path so that's why he said everyone was a victim you will find yourself in the path that we are reading and the other part were not and all that remember they always try to make everyone culpable they try to make the victim the same as them if you notice when the army invaded the leader of IPOB's house they claim oh they were terrorists that's who they are so when the rest of the world laugh at our ignorance you will think you are the same with them that's why they present that picture but remember they will always claim that oh you brought it upon yourself if you were to listen to Azikiwe after the war he was blaming those that were murdered whose properties were stolen for the same thing that was done against them he said they brought it on themselves so you see how sort of the slave master can be so obviously he was more of a mole and perhaps had negro blood but they will always try to blame you alongside themselves why they are doing the same thing if they kill you they will blame you for allowing yourself to be killed if you noticed in the invasion of Nandikano's house for example you will remember that even the southeastern governors including the educated ones we are all on the side of the Fulani without telling you what the victims did but then you see here where it tells us that speaking of the new free country which is governed by two chiefs Ezuisa and Ma Ma Magia, Mali Magia remember when the Fulani step in when they get one leg into the door they will create their own chief from their own chief they are giving you time after a while they rise up as enemies within and slaughter your own chief 
and take over the whole place. That's how they've done it. They've done it severally for years, for centuries. You can go read it. If anyone doubts, please challenge it. We'll show you where it has happened. It has happened severally. That's the same thing. This was when they were stepping in initially so that you know that this place has been wiped off today. So it says, when I asked the people whether Mamajia sold many slaves, they all burst out laughing and said, how can he sell slaves being a slave himself to the Philatas? That's the Fulanese. So that's how it is. Even in those people you think, oh, we are all Nigerians. If you are not Fulani or Kanuri, you are not anything more than a slave to the slave masters foot soldiers. It's the same game they are playing. Otherwise, if they were just free-minded, the way you are thinking, how come Hausas do not ever rule? No Hausa has ever ruled Nigeria. All those other people you pick, like Obasanjo, those are just Negroes. They condition them because the Negro shows loyalty to his master. They now use them for whatever they want, and they can use them to kill their siblings easily. Remember, if any sensible person gets there, that person will know that these people that are sending me to kill my siblings are not killing theirs. But like we told you, the slave masters, foot soldiers, they lack humanity. They lack common sense. There is no better way to say it. We're sorry. Let us also reference Africa past and present, a concise account of the country, its history, geography, explorations, climates, production, whatever, by an old resident, and this was published 1897, and there we are shown that so please pay very close attention to this and it talks about both the Moors and the Fulanese on the same page we are not sure what the difference could be but we can look at it in a subsequent video but our interest is for you to see that the Negroes are at least different you probably may have had some so-called African Americans claiming to be Moors others claim to be Israelites others claim to be Jews others claim to be Niji, others claim to be Indian, others claim to be Native Americans. But this says the Moors are not of pure Negro blood, but a mixture of the Arab and African races. They are rigid Mohammedans and use the Arabic language in their ordinary intercourse with each other as well as in their religious exercises. Our interest is for you to see their description of the Moors matches closely with that of the Fulas in the other book we referenced earlier. But then, further down, he mentions the Felatas as well, that is the Fulanese. But it says, in features and complexion, the Moors have a strong Eastern caste and are generally more energetic and intelligent than their neighbors. This superiority they make known in an unmistakable manner by their acts of cruelty and oppression wherever they have power to dominate. So you see the same thing the Fulanese do. The same description and he goes further to say not only have the feebler native tribes of western africa suffered much from the tyrannical conduct of the moors but inoffensive travelers have been subject to their treachery as we have seen in the narratives of mongo park major houghton and others so our interest is for you to see who these people were and who they are and then wonder how they just disappeared you notice that no one talks about Moors anymore, except the ignorant so-called African Americans claiming to be Moors. But then, further down, right here on this page, it says, On proceeding southward, down the river Niger, we meet with the Felatas, a numerous and powerful tribe of people whose locality cannot be accurately defined as they are perpetually on the move. Some travelers assert that the Felatas are identical with the Fulas, and that their warlike character and general superiority to that soft and effeminate people is owing entirely to circumstances. Be this as it may, it is evident that the Felatas on the banks of the Niger have pushed forward in aggressive and successful warfare on the less powerful tribes, till they now occupy an influential and commanding position in the many districts where their name was formerly unknown. They have carried their conquests as far as Yoruba and Bogo and established themselves in many important native towns and cities, reducing the people everywhere to a state of abject slavery after the example of the despotic Moors in the northern regions of the continent. So it, they just look like the same in our opinion. We're not sure what the differences are 
if you can decipher this that would be great please put it in the comment section but then further down it says when not actually engaged in war the philatas are described by the landers as active intelligent mild and humane but fighting is evidently their favorite occupation and so high is their opinion of their own prowess that they boldly declare that they would conquer the whole world if the salt water did not prevent them so you see what they are doing you see why they are killing people now we ask you they claim that it is god god gave them the land how can the creator of heaven and earth create all of us and then give someone else land without the, giving the other person does this really make sense to you if it makes sense to you please put it in the comment section let us reference The White Man in Nigeria by George Douglas Hazeldine and it was published 1904 and there we are told that the worship of the white man is one thing, it is like the worship of the Fulani, the worship of the gun is another, it is the worship of the thunder and the whirlwind, the house of soldier is about right, the gun is greater than the horse or the maxim, the Fulani conquered the people with cavalry hordes of horsemen moving great distances in the night, jangling, shouting, screaming, spreading panic, right and left, slashing, riding down and trampling on the unarmed and industrious Hausa. Let us also reference letters and sketches from northern Nigeria by Martin S. Kishke and this was published in 1910 and there we are shown that Slave raiding with all its attendant horrors was being carried on by the northern Mohammedans upon the southern pagans and the latter divided into a vast number of small tribes were constantly engaged in intertribal warfare. In the south, cannibalism, slave dealing, witchcraft and trial by ordeal were rife. In no direction were native traders even when traveling within their own provinces, save from the murderous attack of organized rubber bands and their chiefs. No European had for purely trade purposes established a single post 50 miles from the Niger or Benue river. And our interest is for you to see that slave raiding with all its attendant horrors was being carried on by the northern Mohammedans upon the southern pagans and the latter divided into a vast number of small tribes were constantly engaged in tribal warfare. Remember, the slave master will always find justification. They claim they were constantly involved in tribal warfare, which we all know is not true, because you can't be fighting over nothing. That's the truth of it. They were running away from slave hunters, so they certainly did not have the power to fight back, because if they had that power, they would have fought the slave hunters instead of their own siblings directly to show you that it was something they did with a lot of pride and a lot of swag we see where it tells us that the sultan was very friendly to them and denam who remained some time in bonu was allowed to accompany the sultan's troops on various expeditions and slave raids thus learning a great deal about the country and the people meanwhile clapperton and Odney pushed on to kano but before their arrival, Odney died of consumption. Our interest is for you to say that it was their official way of doing things. If slave raiding was illegal, why would some British come and visit the Sultan and accompany the slave hunters? That's the, the, what you call your Nigerian army today on slave raids. That should be your question to answer and your question to ask too. So you see that it was something they were doing. And as far as they were concerned, they were doing the right thing. Let us also reference the Sudan, a short compendium of facts and figures about the land of darkness by H. K. W. Com, PhD. And this was published in 1907. And there we are shown that the city was stormed, the hearts set on fire, and the slave raiders poured in volley after volley until the poor inhabitants all lay low. When the morning dawned, Rabba's troops marched through the streets up to the marketplace, gathering up as they passed the compounds, all who were left alive, children, babies and women. The men were usually dispatched, also the older women. Boys and girls were tied neck to neck, long strings of them and away they were driven down towards the core. 
our interest is for you to see how the slave hunts were done by these groups. And then remember, notice he called it the open saw of Africa. Now, when you keep taking sides with them to say, oh, Africans sold us, Africans sold out their people, it doesn't make sense. You need to dig deep and find out who was behind it. You have all the records. Your forefathers wrote some things. Have you read them? So, another thing of interest here is you see a slave in the field. So, you see that their own interest in the slave trade was more of their sadistic nature. They enjoy pain. They enjoy human suffering. If you notice, whenever they are in power, people suffer. They starve people. They make sure that businesses are strangled and closed. That's who they are. It doesn't change. And that's why the slave master always struggles to put them in power. In every way, shape or form, that's what he does always. If you check the history and the records, you will understand what we're talking about. Let us also reference the African slave trade and its remedy by Thomas Fowle Buxton Esquire. And this was published 1840. And there, we are again shown what people do when they hear that the Fulanese were coming. And it says, Speaking of the incursions of the Felathas, scarcely a night passed, but we heard the screams of some unfortunate beings that were carried off into slavery by these villainous depredators. The inhabitants of the towns in the route of the Felathas fled across the river on the approach of the enemy. A few days after the arrival of the fugitives, a column of smoke rising in the air about five miles above the confluence marked the advance of the Felathas and in two days afterwards, the whole of the towns, including Adakuda, and five or six others were in a blaze. The shrieks of the unfortunate wretches that had not escaped, answered by the loud wailings and lamentations of their friends and relations, encamped on the opposite bank of the river, at seeing them carried off into slavery and their habitations destroyed, produced a scene which, though common enough in the country, had seldom, if ever, before been witnessed by European eyes, and showed to me in a more striking light than I had hitherto beheld it, the horrors attendant upon slavery. So you see how brutal it was. And the book we referenced earlier corroborates this account as well, and it says, Then again, every woman about to become a mother went and hid in the bush like a wild beast, until the baby was old enough not to be a fatal encumbrance in case of a hasty flight. Then again, the rumor that the Fulani were coming emptied great villages and scattered the people over the face of the earth. Then again, the old and feeble were put to the sword. Then again, children became scarce, the fields lay idle, and the land flowed with blood. So you see how it was that people were running away at that time from them. But you see how they have turned the whole thing around today. Even while they are still doing what they were doing, they are still saying, Oh, we are all Africans. We are all Nigerians. We encourage you to find time to conduct your own research. And of course, here we come to the end of this edition of Fulani, The Enemy Within, A Reply, Part 2. We thank you very much for listening. And we encourage you to find time to conduct your own research or at least to look for the materials referenced and study them yourself. Try to develop a mental picture of what the situation could have been at that time, looking at how they lie brazenly today. That should effectively tell you that they lied against their ancestors, they lied against the Negroes, they lied against the victims of their atrocities the victims of their man's inhumanity to man, and they are unrepentant about it. That's why you see them coming up with different schemes, different psychological stratagems, just to make sure that the Negroes are deceived, to believe that their forefathers could have done these evil against their own people. We thank you very much indeed for listening. Peace.